Traditionally or typically conservation organizations have used a range of different uh, methodologies like camera traps, um, collar data. With environmental DNA we can actually detect all sorts of species that are too cryptic to actually detect on a camera trap or, or something like that. So we can now actually start measuring, even if we've managed to restore all of the species that used to be there historically um, and the vegetation is intact, is that actually improving the functionality of the ecosystem? So I welcome everyone back to the Green Hour. We are live at the Concordia Annual Summit during Climate Week, and I'm sitting here with the leader from African Parks, Angela Gaylord, who is the head of biodiversity and science support at African Parks Network. So I want to thank you for coming on today. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, so last year we were connected with African Parks through CEO Peter Fernhead, and we actually did a series with African Parks, Conservation Across Africa. So the work of African Parks, is it, it means a lot to me. I've learned a lot about it. Um, I'm excited about what's happening in, in conservation across Africa. And so I think this conversation couldn't, couldn't happen at a better time. Great. I'm looking forward to it. So first question I'll ask, can you talk about your current role at African Parks and the work that you lead? Sure. So as head of biodiversity and science support at African Parks, I like to describe my role as having one foot in um, academic science and one foot in actual conservation management. So my um, field of, of experience is actually to be at the interface between science and management. And so what I do is that I am constantly engaging with our managers and practitioners in the field and helping them to make the best conservation decisions, providing support for them to make those decisions based on science and, and on good practice. So where does the science, I'd say science-based stuff come from? Is that research? Is that, where is that exactly coming from? Uh, well, we, we as an organization don't do our own research. We have strategic research partners that do that. But the science that is being used to inform our conservation decisions is coming from decades of um, science and research, which has now formed a body of knowledge that is being used uh, to inform these, these sorts of decisions that we're making and the best practice. So would you say that's challenging, balancing, and trying to bring these two together, science and conservation together? Is that a challenging thing? Yes, it, yeah. it certainly is. Um, and it's why I'm so passionate about what I do, because I really see, in, in my career, I've seen quite a big gap between science and the managers on the ground. And the only way that we can make good decisions that are based on the manager's really great understanding of what's happening on the ground with what science is telling us to do is if we have someone that's bridging that gap or a bridge that's, that's uh, bridging that divide. Um, and once we have that kind of bridge, that makes things uh, much easier. But otherwise, we would really be talking about things disconnected. that exactly. The note that I have down, uh, in your role, you provide support for making decisions on biodiversity and conservation across 23 parks. Can you tell us about what that entails? I mean, I, I just think in my head, 23 parks, you're doing work on that. It seems like a pretty big undertaking. Um, yes, so it, it is. But we because we're using consistent principles and frameworks, it's really just translating that into what that looks like for each park. Um, so there are four different components that encompass the work that, that I do in that role. The first is to provide, uh, to, to provide support on the various decisions that uh, park managers or conservation managers might need to be doing. So, for example, if we go back to the example of the Rhino project that uh, you, you interviewed our, no, our manager, yep, yes, yep, yep. Um, there I would help them to make decisions um, as to where the next rhinos would need to go to, or if if there's a, a new recipient area, I'm on the advisory committee for the rhino project. And so together with uh, my two other colleagues on that committee, we would then talk through the feasibility assessments that have been done, the security and that sort of thing. Then um, the next component of what I do is really creating these strategic research partnerships that I um, alluded to earlier on. And so there, because we're not doing our own research, we actually develop these partnerships with universities all over the world. Oh, wow. um, so we have a very a good 
relationships and partnerships with international universities, but we don't want that to be a sort of a helicopter situation where these international universities come in, do their thing and, and go out again. So what's really important is that we twin those international universities with a local university mm -hmm. in each of the countries that we operate in, making sure that we can enhance the um, scientific capacity of the the um the, the countries that that we're operating in as well. And so those folks will come in and help us to look at the questions or the knowledge gaps that we have in order to be able to understand the systems that we're operating in better. Um, the third component is providing technical support or technical advice, and that's mainly around things like monitoring. What are the best monitoring techniques? If you're doing an aerial survey, what are the sorts of things that you'd need to look out for? Also in terms of how to analyze the data sets after that. Um, and then the, um, the fourth component is looking at um, actually helping the parks to develop various management plans around the sorts of conservation work they're doing. So, for example, most parks that have carnivores need to have a carnivore management plan. Um, we have things like fire management plans, fisheries management plans. So we help the parks to develop those sorts of things. And what we really do like to do is, is to actually bring in the local communities around the parks during those planning processes so that they really are involved in that planning process right from the beginning. Um, so they bring their understanding of the landscape as well. And then we jointly craft those management plans, which, um, which then turn out to be the best for, for the communities as well as, as for conservation. I think your third point, you talked about monitoring and, and tracking, you know, the species and conservation. I think that was my favorite part of the series we did at African Parks because it's like, of all these species we talked about, rhinos was one of them. And it's like, it's very interesting to see how you can track these species, track the conservation efforts, and actually see successes. Um, and I think that's a really valuable piece of your work that you probably see pretty frequently. Yes, absolutely. And one thing that we're starting to use now in terms of monitoring is environmental DNA. Um, so that's been really transformative for us because we, at the moment, uh, traditionally or typically conservation organizations have used a range of different uh, methodologies like camera traps, um, collar data, uh, those sorts of things. With environmental DNA, we can actually detect all sorts of species that are too cryptic to actually detect on a camera trap or, or something like that. But I think even beyond that, what's really exciting about using environmental DNA is that we can use that now even to um, estimate the population sizes of our species so we can see whether the actions, the conservation actions we've put in place are actually helping to grow those populations. And now we're even busy with a, a um, an enhanced component of looking at environmental DNA where we use it together with something called ecological network analysis. And that helps us to see what are all the different interactions between these different species and therefore the functioning of the ecosystem. So we can now actually start measuring, even if we've managed to restore all of the species that used to be there historically um, and the vegetation is intact, is that actually improving the functionality of the ecosystem? So that's something that's really, really exciting for us at the moment. And um, we're the only conservation agency in the world that's actually using this. We're the, we're the first. Um, and yeah, and that's been being supported by the Allen, um, Allen Family Philanthropies. So yeah. So how does how does because I, I honestly don't know, but environmental DNA, like how is that collected? What's the process on that? And I guess, how is that leveraged uh, to do what you're doing? So environmental DNA, there's three, well, actually four different components now. Um, there's environmental DNA in water, in feces, and in the soil. Now, even in the air, we haven't started using the environmental DNA in the air. So if what we're looking at at the moment is, is the soil, water, and fecal matter. Um, and that's the other thing that makes it so... Um, efficient and, and I think a little bit easier for us to do than typical measures um, because it doesn't need a high level of skill. 
we literally just need to decide where in the landscape to go out um, and and find the samples. And then we it literally is just a case of of collecting a some a fecal sample. So scat that you can identify, you know it comes from a lion. As long as you're not contaminating it, put it in a bag and that gets sent off to a lab. And then we can see, we can get all sorts of information out of that about the gender of that animal, about the um the population sizes, if we collect enough of it, but even what that animal has been eating and what the species it's been eating has been eating wow. as well. So you learn a lot about the ecosystem surrounding Absolutely. the entire ecosystem. Absolutely. Wow. Um, and then the same thing really with water eDNA. You just need a special a little vial that you can collect it in with a filter on so that it filters out any debris that might be in there. And with the soil, um, you just use a, a soil corer to actually get, get at the soil. So again, the main thing is not to get that contaminated with any other you know, human um, DNA or anything like that. And then the hard work gets done by the people in, in the laboratories. So I think the final question I'll ask, I mean, we talked about the Rhino Rewild project briefly, but what are some projects you're currently working on uh, today uh, with African Parks? So what I'm spending quite a lot of time doing at the moment is looking at the feasibility of reintroducing uh, different species into into the different parks. So one of the first things that we do when we take on a new protected area is that we start looking into what were the species that historically occurred on that landscape. And then we we look at um, have the conditions of the environment changed so much that we wouldn't be able to successfully restore them there? We follow the whole IUCN process. So actually, the first question to ask is, has the threat that extirpated that species been um, addressed? Or if if not, then we, we wouldn't be able to bring it in. So there's a whole list of, of questions that we, we have a look at. Um, and then we speak to the relevant IUCN specialist groups and uh, we get someone to come out and, and actually um, check whether the conditions are, are appropriate there. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a lot of, of what I'm doing at the moment. Um, but also looking at, at fire and fire management. So... In Africa, fire is, especially in African savannas, fire is one of the major drivers of the ecosystem there. Um, and like anything in life, too much of it is not a right. good thing. Um, so, yeah, those are the sort of practical things that, that I'm looking at at the moment. Yes, interesting. We, um, I was part of a group that was looking at a study using the software called Ecometric Solutions, and it's looking at manufacturing sites or office buildings and then grading the ecosystem, like giving an ecosystem assessment score um, based on the current state, pre-development, and then you try to implement nature-based solutions to improve that ecosystem score. So interesting project we did, but it sounds like, I mean, what you're doing is looking at feasibility analysis. Can we actually integrate these, these species into different areas. Yes, um, yeah, absolutely. And and one of the really interesting things with this eDNA project we're doing is that because it's looking at the whole network of the ecosystem, so what are all the different species, who's eating who, so almost like a food chain kind of analysis, you can actually have a look at if you've reintroduced a species, is it actually improving the functionality of that ecosystem? Um, or if you look at it the other way around, which species should we be reintroducing in order for the functionality of the ecosystem to improve? So all of the monitoring that we do really is focused on tracking whether the conservation interventions that we've put in place are actually having the resultant um, outcomes that we were, were looking for. So it helps us to keep track of that and adapt our management where things are not necessarily going according to our original plan. Yeah, I think it's really valuable to actually look at that data and actually figure out when you bring species into areas, is it going to degrade the ecosystem that you actually bring it into? So mer I think back to the point in the beginning, it's merging the science and the conservation together. Uh, and it's brilliant, I would say. But Angela, thank you so much for coming on today. Um, I really appreciate you joining us. You're very welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you.